Well, thank you very much, Ron. Um, and thank you very much to the CPMA for inviting us uh, to participate in such a very important uh, webinar, talking about some of the major challenges we have today in the supply chain. But first of all, um, who is SHAFE? SHAFE is the Southern Hemisphere Association of Fresh Fruit Exporters. Basically, we are an entity that represents leading trade associations from different countries in the Southern Hemisphere, such as Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Chile, New Zealand, Peru, South Africa, and Uruguay. Amongst us, we represent around about 11 million tons of fresh fruit with an export value of 15.8 billion US dollars and 25% of the global supply of fresh fruit is currently coming from the Southern Hemisphere. The supply chain in recent uh, weeks has seen enormous disruptions, increase in costs of production and logistics. For example, in the case of my country, Chile, um, today we're seeing hikes of, in terms of logistical costs of around about 100, 150%. And we calculate, for example, in the case of the Southern Hemisphere, that the, these increasing costs will basically signify to the sector 3.8 billion US dollars in additional uh, expenses. So this is an issue that we cannot ignore. This is an issue which is for sure putting in jeopardy the short-term viability of many small, medium, and even large growers and exporters in the Southern Hemisphere. This is why um, with the leading trade associations across the globe, including the CPMA, the International Fresh Produce Association, Freshville, the China Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, we all formed together a global coalition um, to tackle some of these cost increases and supply chain disruptions, basically with the objective of raising our concerns to key stakeholders, not only within the industry, but outside the industry, talking to government, WTO, the FAO of the United Nations to see what possible solutions there could be, or just simply focusing attention on this dire situation for some growers and exporters across the globe. Basically this coalition, uh, as I mentioned, wants to create outreach and dialogue with key entities. Basically, we're, we want to talk to not only the public sector, but also the private sector, retailers, shipping lines, and of course, talking to the end consumer to create more awareness of the value of fresh produce. It's amazing, and we've talked this quite a lot with uh, my colleague Ron, that a normal consumer doesn't understand all the, 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 the journey of a simple grape from Peru or South Africa or wherever to Canada and all the different challenges that it takes us to get that particular grape fresh, crunchy and, 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 and sweet to the Canadian consumer and other destination park markets across the globe. So we want to focus on promoting the value of fresh produce and hence the value of maintaining the economic sustainability of such an important sector. As I mentioned to you, in the case of SHAFE and the Southern Hemisphere today, basically this situation is costing us around about $3.8 billion. We've, in the very short term, we're now, along with the coalition, outreaching to FAO, World Bank, the OECD, amongst others, and proposing some very concrete solutions to these entities. Like, for example, recognizing fresh fruit as an essential good and all that and all of that which which implies to be an essential good which have significant contribution to the planet's long-term environmental sustainability as well as public health policies maybe some solution is to start regulating the distorted sea freight market um, introduce maybe transport sub subsidies for fruit growers and exporters why not analyze the possibility of having a global zero VAT strategy that would benefit fruit growers? Maybe facilitate greater access to key export markets by way of reducing tariffs. Why not regulate the aggressive promotional price discounts that we see every day in different retailers across the globe on fresh produce that are shrinking the margins of our growers and exporters? 
And finally, why not, for example, ask to have a strengthened public promotional investment in increasing the consumption of our produce and hence justifying potential price increases that we will probably have to do in the very short term, given the current inflationary conditions we are living. So thank you very much for letting us participate in this very important uh, discussion. And we look forward to, to, to hearing and, and debating some of the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Um, I'll take a moment now and uh, share my screen and talk a little bit about you know, what the North American context is and how, uh, how we are seeing very, very similar impacts across uh, North uh, Canada, the US. And I think this is what the major takeaway uh, on this global challenge on supply chains, whether you're located in the Southern Hemisphere, China, South Africa, Europe, everyone is seeing some type of impact across their uh, supply chain and with their product. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the panel. Um, for the North American market and for Canada, uh, when we sit down and start looking at some of the challenges, it's quite interesting. You know, we start seeing how I mentioned earlier, some of those compounding impacts. And Christian talked to uh, some of the same issues that we're seeing here. And let's start from the consumer and go back. Same challenges here in Canada. The consumer truly doesn't understand what it really means to put product from the field to their plate. And they're seeing a food inflation issue that is driving costs. And they're sitting back and they're asking the questions, why? So part of what we've been doing in Canada with CPMA and with our allied partners is messaging with government, but also being active with media to try and talk to them around the issues that our industry is facing. So consumers understand you know, why product is uh, perhaps not the right quality, perhaps not the right freshness, or perhaps higher prices, or perhaps shelf not on the shelf when they're looking for it. But all of this is driven by what you see on screen. When we start looking at the gap in workers, the, the lack of transportation, the logistics, and the multimodal challenges we're seeing across our uh, our industry. You know, when we start looking at all of these pieces, when we're dealing with one-offs, our industry is effective and can, and can manage it. The challenge is the pandemic has truly driven one-offs into a integrated uh, challenge for our, for our industry that continues to go leverage on top of one another from labor to logistics, labor in logistics, labor in warehousing, then labor in fields and so on and so forth on the labor file alone. We go beyond that, we start looking at the challenges around regulatory issues. We start seeing issues around access to shipping containers. And I can go on and on with areas that I think everyone has either experienced or has seen and heard in the media. So what are we doing? Well, in North America, you know, we've taken a very uh, aggressive approach with our partners to try and drive change. You know, we've been working, as you see on screen, with a range of key allied partners that are uh, based in Canada and the U.S. to put a message uh, to both governments in Canada and the United States around key challenges our industry was facing back in November. And our joint statement was very clear relative to the issues and challenges. In January, we took another step forward and we actually regrouped and started proposing not only the issues, but the solutions that are available to us. It, identically in the US, the IFPS through uh, Robert Gunther and Tracy have been very effective in reaching out to uh, their government. And we've seen some actually very uh, positive movements in the US looking at you know their state of the union no, uh, notice on the oversight and increased competition of the ocean shipping lines. You know, ocean shipping lines are a challenge. And in Canada, we're looking at a similar approach under the Competition Act and under the transportation le uh, legislation to see what we can do to work with shipping companies to try and deal with the uh, high costs, the changing in cha their shipping uh, uh, corridors and a range of other issues we've been dealing with. Um, the other piece comes back into port congestion, which is really the hub of a lot of our import strategy in Canada. And really the starting point of the product coming in, either sitting or waiting on dock and then getting off and having a challenge on, on, uh, on trucks. All of these pieces have uh, been identified and talked to, and we'll get more into this with the panel. 
So what have we done? Well, we had the joint statements, lettering, letter campaigns into the government. We've uh, sat down with a uh, national supply chain summit with our federal ministers across multiple departments and had the opportunity to provide our context on the impact of perishable product. And Christian hit it on the head. How do we become essential? It's the same message we're pushing here in Canada. And what does essential mean? The other piece is the pre-budget submission. We submitted our concerns to the federal government in Canada in the uh, pre-budget consultative process. And we hope that it will be, uh, our, our input will be accepted. We've also had the opportunity, Guy and I presented to the uh, House Standing Committee on Agriculture. And through all of our advocacy meet, meetings with government officials, we've been putting this as a front and center issue. The big challenge we know is labor in the warehouse. We've also worked with a coalition outside of fruit and vegetables with the food and beverage industry to push for emergency measures around the temporary foreign worker program post farm gate to try and look at increasing the cap coming available to uh, companies in Canada, as well as some other key components to make it easier to access foreign labor where necessary. And We've been very aggressive as well with other groups around containers and working with the chamber. And most recently, of course, on the issue with CP Rail, um, trying to uh, get the government to be involved earlier uh, to address the uh, potential uh, uh, lockout and or labor action uh, by uh, employees with the uh, railway. So I'll just close before going to the panel. Where do we go to from here on supply chain and logistics? I use this when we uh, talk at our town halls. 2022 is a year where we need to continue to bob and weave. There's no other way to say it. You know, we will continue to see challenges. We're not out of the woods yet. The pandemic still throws curves at us. As Christian said, we see similarities in all regions of the world. And as a world group, we need to start looking at how we address this. And it starts here in Canada and North America. So with that, I will ask our uh, panel to uh, come off camera or on camera. And I will just a second here. There we are. All right, everyone. There we go. So you know, the, what we've heard very quickly through Christian and through myself on some of the challenges will give you an opportunity, each of you, to talk about your experiences, some solutions. But I want to stop with, start with, I think, the biggest question, and that is, you know, you've all had an opportunity to uh, see this, the issues firsthand. So from your observations, how do you feel we've handled, you know, the pandemic? How have we navigated it? Have we done a good job? You know, what have we done relative to our supply chains to uh, try and understand and, and adapt? And at the end of it all, what still keeps you up at night relative to supply chain disruptions? And as we have our chair of CPMA, I'm going to go to Guy first with, uh, with that question and open it up to the rest of the panel afterwards. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, to be here today. Um, I take your opportunity to invite you to CPMA Montreal. That's coming very fast, uh, April uh, 5 to 7. I hope to see uh, many of you guys up here in Montreal for the first uh, in person after several years of disruptions. So how did we handle it? I think we did what we could. The first years of pandemic was totally new. It was totally, we were in the mud. We were advancing in the dark. Uh, the second year we learned from our mistake, but there is a lot of factors such as mother nature that was totally out of control. So there's a lot of stuff that happened during the pandemic that was totally out of our control in, in different area. Other than that, I, I think our biggest challenges and what keeps me up at night remains labor. You know, if you have material shortages, truck prices, agriculture product shortages, container disruption, port congestion, warehouse slowdown, stores under staff, it's all coming back to a labor issue. So we should all concentrate our effort there. And once we really try to find solution for labor, slowly all the other disruption will slowly fade out. This is my, my five cents. And I, I, we put more of our effort into the labor issue than anything else because they are, at the end of the day, all related. So 
we're going to touch a little bit later, Guillaume Labor. I, I, I think that you, what you hit on is key. But you did mention weather. And let's talk a little bit about the weather. And I'm going to throw that question over the same question on observations and what keeps you up at night to uh, Julie. Because, you know, Julie, you lived uh, through atmospheric w- rivers, you know, severe heat. You know, what are your thoughts and feelings around how, how things have navigated possible solutions and what still keeps you up at night? Up, oh, you're gonna. You're on mute still, uh, Julie. Oh, luck. There we Can go. You hear me now? Now we hear you. That's okay. I just learned something about technology after two and a half years. You'd think I'd know all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much for having me. I, I, I work with Save On Foods and by extension, the Patterson Food Group. Um, so we have um, most of the concentration of our operates, operations in the West. Um, I, am in, uh, I work in public affairs and corporate responsibility. So I do a lot of work with agriculture um, in my normal life, um, which is now this life after two years. I think um, we are living in the new normal. Um, I would say the uh, first, the effects of the pandemic um, certainly had a significant impact on our supply chain, just uh, starting with panic buying. And then as we've moved through to um, all the impacts that everyone has faced, but um, you add to that a heat dome um, in, in the summertime, which um, led to actually um, a spontaneous fire, which actually decimated an entire town in Linton, DC, as an example, by um, just as, as a result of the impacts of, I think the rail system by something. Um, then a, a series of wildfires, which uh, caused a lot of instability in our in our uh, mountain systems and our land, um, which was then um, um, tested and I guess failed by um, an atmospheric river, which hit on uh, November 14th, which brought more rain to um, the interior, the lower mainland in Abbotsford in particular, um, in one week than normally you would get in one year. Um, we saw uh, the result of that was the um, the most catastrophic environmental um, impact in um, the last century in BC, uh, which cut off all of the road systems from the lower mainland and rail um, to into the lower mainland for a number of weeks, um, caused uh, five deaths and um, a huge, huge amount, I think $450 million in damage to um, the prim- primarily the agriculture um, basin. Uh, in the lower mainland and also um, some cities in the interior. So um, we were left with a situation where um, add to that um, border constraints, um, COVID constraints, um, the lack of a workforce um, um, in our in our um, trucking community that was able to move goods around. Uh, we went from a, a scenario where in ordinary times we move, um, I don't think something, the number was something like 6,800 trucks a day um, on our roads. And we were down to 700 um, through one route, which was open one way in the middle of winter. So um, it's been interesting Um, with my lessons learned. And um, what keeps me up at night, I guess, is that um, well, what always keeps me up at night, I've been working in disaster um, response and emergency management response for 20 years, probably. And what I've always um, wished for is that we would um, take the best of what we learned in those times and apply it to the rest. And I think we're in a crisis still. Um, I think it's a different kind of a crisis, which has seen a slower pace to respond, especially from um, governments and committees for lots of good reasons, Ron. But um, I'm, I always worry that we will forget what we learned in the middle of doing something really, really well when we had no choice, um, because I believe right now we also have no choice. So it's interesting because you experienced, I'm going to hand it over to Stuart in a second, but you really experienced rapid change in how government reacts, which we traditionally don't see. We saw it at the beginning of the pandemic yeah. and you saw it regionally and you saw a very good connectivity between federal, provincial, municipal to deal with. And, and industry crisis. and industry. It was really, really interesting. What, what I, what, what I was um, most proud about for, for Canada actually, and, and most fascinated by is, is as that unfolded, um, the amount of collaboration and trust that came between the parties, and I count industry, all industry stakeholders, um, competitors, um, suppliers, and the like, uh, with all levels of government, um, literally 
sitting down to problem solve. Uh, what we, what I observed is that when we need to, we can move mountains, literally, and did. And and when we are able to cooperate and really put our stuff on the table and and think about things from a solution oriented perspective, not a um, risk mitigation perspective, if you will. Um, we can we can get a lot done. Industry is very our industry is is very um, quick to move. We're 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 innovative by design. We have to be, and I don't think the pace that we operate at is something that is well understood by anyone other than us, including government. And I think they got a taste of that during um, the the impacts on our road systems and our rail systems that made them understand that they don't understand, which is a huge opportunity for us to continue those conversations in a collaborative way that. I worry that, you know, two more months go by and it gets left by the wayside and we go back to positional conversations, which um, don't move at the speed we need to move right now or ever, actually. Agreed. Stuart, let's throw the same question to you. What are your thoughts? No, I I think twofold and and Julie and Guy both hit on some great points. I think we saw a level of industry collaboration that has never happened before. I think that was between associations, government, companies, competitors, um, people coming together to help each other solve problems at the end of the day to feed people, to get product onto retail shelves, product to food service providers and everything else. So the, the collaboration was was unprecedented and, and also the ability for companies to adapt and react quickly. You saw people changing strategies, whether that was around logistics, supply chain, port of entry, commodities, you name it. The the amount of people's ability to react on a dime was was pretty pretty impressive and, and having to continue to do that. When you solve one problem, you know, there was something else coming down the pipeline, which sort of leads me into my response to what keeps me up at night. It, it's frankly, what's next? I mean, what are, what are the next challenges we're going to have to do? We, we saw a global pandemic turn into a, a flood situation that isolated part of our country into a vaccine mandate that took a significant portion of our cross-border truck capacity off the road. And, and now a uh, the situation happening between Russia and Ukraine, you know, that and the impact that's having on the downstream effect. I mean, it's 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 unfortunate that we're in this position to have to worry about what's next, but truly what is the next thing that's coming down the pipeline that we're all going to have to figure out a solution to react to. But I think if there's any industry that's able to do it, um, you know, we're at the forefront of being able to meet those challenges. So you you framed that well to hand it over to Christian relative to that global context with the geopolitical issues happening. Christian, what what are some of the things you're seeing from the Southern Hemisphere perspective, but also from some of that those discussions we've had globally? It's a very interesting question. Uh, just early on today, we were in a, in a panel discussion with Shafe in regards to some of the impact of the Russian-Ukrainian situation and conflict. And for sure, um, fruits that are coming from our region, such as citrus, apples, Pears are the key products that um, will definitely not be able to reach the market via the established routes that we once knew. Um, That will obviously have a domino effect in regards to quite possibly more product going into other markets. We have to wait and see if that is is possible, whether the, the markets can handle it. But at the same time, we're seeing, you know, these increased costs, the, the, this conflict, and also uh, in, in many markets, a global recession. So the other question is, are consumers going to be able to consume these products at a relatively uh, 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 acceptable price? Yeah. Uh, in the case of going back again to the to this Russian conflict, um, it's going to be very difficult for all of us, but especially for suppliers from Argentina and South Africa who have historically dominated the Russian market. Yeah. And uh, today they're looking at different alternatives and markets, possibly for their apples and pears and citrus in the Middle East, um, North America for sure, and uh, some particular markets in, in Europe. And that begs the question, what does that look like at market saturation, uh, which is something we're going to be have to watch. So we're going to hold that discussion because there's another question I have. I want to try and tease that out. But I think what I heard, so, you know, the discussion around our logistics that we heard from you, you know, the challenges across multiple areas, uh, labor, um, weather, you know, how government uh, works together, speed, knowledge level, all these components. So I mentioned when I when I did my overview that there was a supply chain task force in Canada and we were part of that task force. We provided our input. 
Uh, we, it was hosted by the transport minister, uh, Al Gabra, and his cabinet colleagues. And I think we had a good opportunity to really frame solutions. Now, if you were sitting in front of the uh, elected officials in Canada or around the world, what would you say to them relative to priorities, issues, and solutions on the supply chain? And let's let's maybe start backwards. And uh, we'll start with uh, Christian looking at globally and squeeze it back to North America. Again, a very good question. I, I did mention some points in, in my, pre, my intervention, but and you said it is well run. I mean, we need to frame this in a, 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 and try to voice our concerns and position fresh fruits as an essential good. And, we got, and all that that entails, given the priorities, maybe reducing the costs associated to transport via subsidies, reducing uh, barriers to market access, at the end of the day, facilitating that our produce is able to reach the end consumer and optimal conditions and at a fair price. Having said that, at a trade level, there's probably another area that we need to focus on at a consumer level in regards to informing the average consumer about the value of fresh produce, the real value of fresh produce, and making them understand the journey that that particular product has to make from different markets around the world to their dining room table and all the challenges that we're facing so that they appreciate, they start valuing all the efforts our industry is doing and start valuing economically all these efforts on the part of small, medium and large size growers and exporters across the globe. Great point. So let's talk a little bit then about Canada and North America. So on a global perspective, are there any of those elements that translate to, to us here in Canada? Are there any other elements we need to focus on? And I'll open it up. Stuart, Julie, Guy, who wants Stuart? You're up. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, the, the, you'd ask, uh, you know, my ask would be twofold. One would be removing red tape and, and barriers to to free moving economies. Uh, you know, we understand uh, the importance of, of what COVID-19 mandates example have done um, to, to help us get to where we are today in dealing with this pandemic, but also what it did when it was implementing things like the cross-border vaccine mandate that was that was implemented reciprocally between Canada and the US. I mean, that took 15%, 15 to 20% of the available cross-border truck drivers off the road overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, just again, and that has downstream effects through the entire supply chain. Uh, which in the end either drives up cost at, at uh, the stores or, or simply doesn't give us the ability to execute on getting product there in the first place. Uh, the second would be around understanding the problem and supporting it. Uh, things like incentives for companies to train and hire new truck drivers to deal with the labor shortage that we have you know, across North America with, with a shortage of people willing to, to get in and become long haul drivers. Um, incentives to support those problems and bring solutions to the table would be a, a huge benefit to the industry as a whole. Uh, insurance rebates, I've heard also brought up on trucks. Absolutely. Great. Whatever, you know, the, the industry, the trucking industry for, for many years has been such a low margin business that the costs, you know, we've seen it fuel represents 40% of a trucking company's operating costs. And, and look what we've seen happen to fuel prices here in the past six to eight weeks. Now, you know, the markets are reacting and compensating to that level, but for so long, these trucking companies have been so cash strapped, if you will, insurance rebates, driver training rebates, how, however you can compensate them to keep money in their pocket that they can turn around and invest in getting more equipment on the road. Uh, is going to have a huge effect and impact downstream on the industry. So I'm going to ask Julie, you know, you were heavily involved in, you know, making sure Canadians that were at risk during the start of the pandemic and as we move through the system were getting food. Um, and they're, they tend to be the lost group when we look at a, a supply chain disruption, right? Because in the end, we're all scrambling just to get food on the shelves and there are some individuals in urban centers, rural areas, Northern Canada, that may not have the same luxury of even being able to one, afford it with food inflation, but two, access it. What are your thoughts on the food security discussion that's coming out of the uh, supply chain issue? That's a great question to have. We have what, a whole day for this. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I sit on the National Food Policy Advisory Council in service to Minister Bibo, um, which which in um, part is um, oriented toward ensuring um, safe, accessible, healthy food for all Canadians. 
Um, I sit on the board of Food Banks BC and I help um, with a number of school food programs. And um, in the early days of the pandemic, probably within the first day of the pandemic, we had a battle cry from teachers was the first call um, where kids who were depending on um, school, like very loosely um, orchestrated school nutrition programs, um, the need went from 40 kids who might need a backpack of food over the weekend to um, 400 in that school um, because they didn't know where their next meal was going to be coming from because we were also up against the spring break and then school closures. Um, we have 2 million kids in our country that were going with, had no idea where their food is coming from every day, actually, and it went to 3 million. Um, this is a new stat. Uh, we had one in seven food uh, homes in Canada that were uh, food insecure um, before the pandemic, and now it's at least one in eight. Or maybe I got those numbers wrong. It's, it's worse now, um, much worse now. Um, and, um, and, and government, um, rightly, I think, at the time, um, pumped a lot, a lot of money, hundreds of millions of dollars into the social network system to provide for access to food at, at all to these, um, these citizens who are in need of help, many of which were new to the system because they were hit by the pandemic and loss of jobs and so on. So the need for, the need for support to get access to food went up. Um, the, the ability to do that went down because we were sitting at some points at service levels of somewhere between 60 and 70%, where normally it's 95 um, and there wasn't any shrink around. So there, you know, the, at the end of the day, um, I think what we need to think about is, is thinking about, again, what's an emergency? Um, what, what, what could industry do collectively in collaboration with government to solve some of these problems? Um, what I will say any chance I get and have done for many, many years is we do not need to reinvent the wheel here in Canada on how it is that we distribute food and, and how it is that we get food to citizens all over this nation. What we need to do is make those who don't understand, understand what it is that we have the power to do and we're able to, and when we're given the facility to do that. And I think that um, if that, if that, um, if, if everyone who has influence over this has the opportunity to sit down together and understand what problem we're trying to solve and then tap into the innovation capabilities and the problem solving capabilities and the and the the knowledge that we have in our business to be able to to do what it is they think can't be fixed we could fix it for everybody instead we spend most of our time trying to educate people who want to just do it that some way they think would be better without having a hope of understanding how we actually move food around in this country so um i don't know if that answers your question ron but what i think is there's a lot of um there's a lot of more concentrated effort we could be um, um, maximizing on for efficiencies um, that would help all of us do our jobs better, which is feed Canadians, if we were given the ability to do so. Um, and I want to move on to another question, but I think the other piece comes back to, and I know we've chatted about this in the past, is how effectively are these systems across Canada harmonized? on distribution, on food security structure distribution, right? And how do we align? Not at all. I agree. Yeah, but not, at, not at all. And 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 the, um, the amount of investment that, like I say, is going into the immediate emergency, which is feed people today, needs to be leveraged into, we have the systems and the capabilities to, to deal with these matters today. We do. We just have to, um, we need to be given the ability to, to do so. And we've just demonstrated now, we've had a case study example now in Canada of our ability to do just that when the, when, when the problem is put in front of us for us to solve collectively. We did it with the floods. We did it with the, with the, with the, with the, the impact to our road systems and our distribution system. And with these, with these floods that just happened, it happened in Eastern Canada at the same time. And when there's a problem to be solved, we can solve it. The, the challenge is whether or not those who are now talking to us about things that need to be changed or, or adjusted understand the urgency of the problem and the deal and, and, and the fact that, you know, um, people, if they think people are going hungry um, and going to be without food in three months, we can't spend three months waiting, what, writing a white paper about it, talking about our perspectives on that. We have to get, feed them Agreed. and people have to be paid to do the work. Yeah. Right. Can't, it can't happen for free. Agreed. I want to quickly uh, wrap this one up with one more question on the same topic to Guy, and that comes back to you, uh, the import market. And so the geopolitical environment uh, in Russia, uh, well, in the Ukraine due to Russia and the uh, challenges now we heard Christian talk about fruit looking for a home. 
you know, what's your thoughts on what that means? We've already seen all these supply chain disruptions and we see food inflation and we see challenges that, you know, everyone's having the, uh, you know, bob and weave for. Um, what about now a potential shift in product movement that ha would have a traditional home? Well, Ron, this is uh, already started. We're seeing a different international market. I mean, one that react more rapidly is the banana market. And, you know, as difficult as, as it was for the past three, four, five months, suddenly uh, Central Americas are lacking almost half a million cases per week that they actually don't know where to go. And they are not sending in everywhere, but it put pressure on the all international market put pressure, even if you don't get that specific fruit, it does affect the entire market. So we're expecting so many other area uh, to be affected, no matter if it's citrus, apples and pear from different countries. Um, we're kind of afraid that there's going to be some dumping coming up in the next some time. You know, we're not looking only for a month ahead of us. It's probably going to affect for the next year to come and maybe even more. And uh, it is very hard to, to understand how big this will affect the industry. It, it will not affect much the North American trade on vegetables that are actually grown in North America, but the fruit sector is going to be more at risk. And uh, everything that is either from Southern Hemisphere, uh, what's left in, in Chile, uh, uh, South Africa, Central America, these markets are going to be under huge pressure. And unfortunately, dumping is is there to come for sure um quickly i just want to go back on previous question because christian has has nailed it right on the right question about the real value of fresh fruit and vegetables and he was saying to educate the consumer about the real value of fresh fruits and vegetables i would say that we also need to educate and make sure government understand the real value of the fresh fruit and vegetables because the investment to drive consumption is, is so important. Uh, making fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables essential is a must because every millions of dollars spent in produce consumption is probably several millions saved in medical and health expenses down the road. And unfortunately, even if everybody knows that the produce are good for health, I think there is some too much uh, black tape and red tape on, on government issue that the dots are not connecting and the dollars are not adding. The long run investment is will be collecting dividend for so many years if we can really uh, drive the product consumption through government. Yeah, and, government's and, rule. Go uh, ahead. Oh, sorry, I was going to say really quick, and, and on that geopolitical piece, Ron, before uh, that, that Guy was touching on there, uh, a big current concern we're hearing from growers, both domestically here in North America, South America, and globally, is the fertilizer situation. Uh, a shortage of fertilizer, pricing skyrocketing, an inability to get forward commitments that they're going to be able to get through all of their crops. Uh, Russia is the largest exporter globally of fertilizer. If you if you take into account the seven billion dollars they export annually and the the just short of three billion dollars that Belarus exports, uh, I mean these trade implications globally with Russia, what's happening. It takes $10 billion worth of fertilizer potentially out of a market that's already short and already struggling. Um, we talk to growers every day and we ask them the same question, what's keeping you up more than anything at night? That is is one of the number one issues they're facing as well too that we need to be aware of. Yeah, you know what, and the fertilizer and the inputs, a range of other inputs as well, we're hearing uh, concern and in many ways, a lot of already in the pipeline that we have for this year's production in Canada, but. Uh, as Guy mentioned, it's the long game that everyone's now looking at, which is the concern. I want to go back to labor. Um, you know, we've uh, we've really done a good job on navigating absenteeism due to COVID, um, job shortages, all the incentives uh, that at the beginning of the pandemic were really disincentives to work for many in our uh, our sector that we uh, managed through. Um, but you know, some people are saying we may be coming uh, out of some challenges. And I just want your perspective to see, you know what, are you seeing light at the end of the tunnel? You know, is industry adapting well? Um, is there something the government can do to continue to help us to drive our labor force? So three big questions. How, how are we doing? You know, what have we done well? And then what can the government do to help? And I open it up to the panel. First one to answer. Guy. Let me jump in. 
All right. So we see light at the end of the tunnels. Um, as far as labor issue, that is a long run. We discussed many times before. It's not just COVID that we create these labor issue. It comes like 10 and 20 years down the road. It is a generation issue. I'm not going to extend on that. But today's younger generations are not looking and doesn't have for the same value than, than the 30s and 40s and 50s workers. Uh, and, and this, we need to understand it to adapt and try to find solution for that. The other point is when we talk about labor issue, um, foreign temporary worker is, is accessible for growers, but we need to make it more accessible to the rest of the industry in the supply chain, no matter if it's within warehouses, uh, distribution company, uh, transportation company. You know, the government has very easy listening when it goes to talk about growers uh, work uh, labor force, but they need to listen more about the rest of the supply chain because we're there too and we're an essential part of that disruption. That's a great point. What are you, what are your thoughts, everyone? I know we uh, we continue to talk about you know immigration in Canada is a driving force between how we can find new uh, a new em uh, employee base and you know cultivate and develop uh, a new group of uh, produce professionals. How do you see immigration fitting into uh, into the puzzle as we move forward? Because there was a gap, immigration almost stopped um, during the uh, beginning of the pandemic. I think, like you said, there's going to be a lot of industries putting up their hand and saying we need support from that immigration labor force to be able to be sustainable and continue to grow our businesses. Um, the produce industry whole as a collaborate collaboration through CPMA, whatever it is, has to be at the front of that line asking for that help and support because we know all the other sectors are going to be out there doing it. Agreed. Agreed. Are there any other thoughts on labor before uh, Julie? Um, yeah, I, I would echo what the other panelists have said there, on. I was going to crack a joke, but I don't know all the people on this <laughs> webinar. But, you know, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes it's a train. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that um, having their, uh, having a, a, a smoother pathway to allowing for uh, new immigrants, uh, refugees, and so on to come to work when they want to work, make it easier for that to happen, processes for that to take place, anything we can do. Um, even at retail, it's a tough run out there. Um, I don't, I mean, we haven't talked about that today, but uh, the, you know, the effects of the um, the mental state, I guess, of, of the average shopper and, and the effects, the downstream effects of that on the average person working in a retail grocery store is really, really tough. Like I, I, I could, again, we could have a whole nother panel on that, but um, it's a tough, it's a, it's, I, you know, I've been in the business for 32 years. And I started out working in a grocery store and it was a lot of fun. My daughter works in a grocery store and I can tell you, she's been there the whole way through that pandemic and it wasn't a lot of fun. Yeah. Like it's, it's, and there's a lot of um, recognition that has to happen for all, all of the pieces of our supply chain, all the way down to the retail. But I think the, the more that we could actually give some ease to, um, to those, the pressures that are, are leaders in those various pieces of the supply chain with, with the ability to access people who want to work and, and, can, can make that road smoother, I think the, the better off we are. And I think that as COVID restrictions ease, that'll all get a little bit better, but uh, people remember what it felt like. So we got some work to do. I agree. You know, I want to ask the same question to Christian because while in Canada, you know, we're looking for labor and, uh, you know, there there's a challenge on absenteeism, it's not necessarily the same discussion. There are labor challenges in the rest of the world, but it's a slightly different nuance in different jurisdictions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so in, in the Southern Hemisphere, we have different situations of labor. Um, some countries are very much, uh, I wouldn't say dependent, but complement their current labor with immigration. For example, in my own country, in Chile, we we do uh, welcome uh, uh, uh migrants to work in, in pack houses, fields uh, from the region uh, because are the, the level of production during some parts of the season really needs more hands. Yeah? So uh, for sure, it's a, it, it, in some countries, it's a little bit different. Uruguay, for example, which is a different scale um, of production, that's not one of the major issues. So it does vary, but at least in, in the case of Chile, we, are, we, we, we do require uh, quite a lot of labor, especially during the cherry and blueberry seasons, 
which are very labor intensive. So uh, there is a question that came in. I'm going to pose it now because I think it does link into some of this discussion. And do remind the uh, webinar participants, please use the Q&A box to pose any questions. Um, so the question is, we hear a great deal about how techno technological innovation can positively impact produce all across the supply chain. Could the panelists speak to what they expect in terms of what the impact is around technology and innovation uh, and what it could be on the long term? And is, true, is innovation truly going to make a significant positive impact over the next few years? Right, I'm gonna take this one real quick. Um, obviously technology will, is definitely a big help. You know, we're in 2022, lots of technologies are actually there affordable, we need to use it. Everything that is innovation that will help either in harvest or in help with labor, every little itch that we can get is definitely helping because we're gonna be struggling for labor for some time. So sometime some technologies are not magical, they won't help you 50% on your labor, but every four or 5% that you grab here and there, at the end of the day, make significant change. And this is what make the difference between being able to do your workload in a normal day or not. Stuart. Yeah, I was gonna say, great great point, uh, Guy. I think there's lots of great technology out there that can help with increasing yield or crop forecasting, and those are great and, and they bring value. But where you can find efficiencies in automation, in production, pack house uh, equipment, anything that can replace something being done by a human, you know, is, you know, we're sounding like a broken record here, but the labor conversation continues to be at the forefront of a lot of this. And it's going to help us be sustainable, again, to take control of our own destiny a little bit, if you will, with those investments in automation and technology to help make sure we have the the ability to produce what the industry demand is for. So I think well said, Guy, it was perfect. So I'm going to throw a wrench into this though, Guy. Yeah, no problem. Looking at the supply chain and uh, I'll throw Julie in the middle of it. How do you innovate? Uh, you know, in that last mile where you walk into a produce department, do we want to see a conveyor belt moving our product into on the shelf or do we want a person there to interact with? How does, how does the innovation piece fit in retail? Well, it's an interesting, you know, there's two pieces to that, right? The first I'll speak to uh, the distribution network. So the, the, the future of a strong distribution network is the ability to create, um, frankly, higher paying jobs through automation to, to allow us to be more efficient at how we handle our goods coming into the DCs, going back out of the DCs, maximizing our trucks and our loads and our efficiencies like AI around demand and where it needs to go and sending uh, the right inventory to the right places and matching consumer demand. Um, absolutely. I mean, techno you can't you wouldn't want to get away from it, actually. If you want to be efficient about things and actually really enable the power of our system, I don't know how we would have done what we did over that six months of, of, of the effects we've been feeling from those floods is even one example if we didn't have the tech we needed to be able to accomplish that, right? Um, now, having said that, um, I used to work in a produce department in a grocery store, and um, there is only, I, in my opinion, at retail, um, now, econ's different, right? No. So set that aside. That's, you know, eight or five or 10% of your sales one day, maybe. But that's different. But that, that you know, the produce clerk working in the grocery store um, needs to pay attention to what they're doing. Like, at the end of the day, the touch that you have at the, at the retail side is needed. I don't think you'd ever want to, nor could you get away from having people working in grocery stores. It's just not. I mean, we've... Everyone's innovated against that a little bit, I think, over time. And um, there's a there's a high touch component of our business that I think is particular to produce that you that you shouldn't want to get away from. But that doesn't mean that um, you can't be more efficient about things and and where you even how you warehouse it in the store, how you where you keep it, where you how you put it out, where you display it, um, all of that. Um, everything can always be more efficient. Whether or not you could automate that, I don't know. Whether or not you'd want to, I don't know. Christian, have you seen uh, on a global level in Southern Hemisphere a uh, an investment recently, a change in investment? Because I know there was investment happening, but has there been a ramp up uh, occurring because of the pandemic? 
I, I think in terms of the pandemic, for sure, uh, investments in innovation have been made as so long as they're directly relate, related to cost efficiencies. Um, before the pandemic, we were already seeing a lot of new investment in innovating in terms of the different varieties, uh, getting varieties that travel better, have uh, organoleptic characteristics that are more favorable to the end consumer, uh, more firmness, et cetera. So for sure, we're seeing in different uh, markets and different supplier countries in the Southern Hemisphere, investing a lot in, in, in changing old varieties and adapting to the new market's requirements. And the other thing I would just wanted to put out there also is we, we're, we're seeing a lot of investments on the part of the sector in terms of sustainability. Sustainability is a huge issue at the moment. And um, uh, this is a, a major challenge that we're facing at the moment, but uh, but most growers and exporters are, are embracing it as, as, as they should, despite the many challenges we're, that we're facing in terms of costs. So I want to circle back now to one of the big pieces we talked about earlier around port congestion. And uh, I noted in the US there was... Uh, some real strong work at the very beginning, likewise in Canada around uh, creating sites away from the ports to actually just get containers out and uh, and reorganize them and then get them into the system. Um, in the US, looking at the shipping lines and looking at uh, various uh, reform acts that will hopefully address some antitrust discussions that are happening uh, in, the, uh, in the shipping industry. Relative to shipping uh, and the port congestion in Canada and to those ports we leverage also in the U.S. to access the Canadian market, what are your thoughts? You know, what can we do as a, uh, as a country to try and address this? Because some will say that we really don't have any control over the, uh, the international shipping companies and uh, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to change. What are your thoughts, Guy and then Stuart? So... The shipping companies are, are doesn't own the port. That's number one. And if you look at the major port in North America, and so as other country, they're privately owned and they are privately operated. So you may have 20 different business model from different ports. This is where government needs to get some structure to make sure that they reach better level. You know, I was talking to to. Uh, an operator from a port in Northeast USA, he was telling me two days ago that he was about 74% staff. You know, that's that's a big, how are we going to get out of this crisis if we cannot get proper labor? Again, we're back to the original question about labor, but we need, government needs to do a push to make sure that these ports are be, are getting the right staff. And you know, the other issue is there's a lot of union in these ports, even if they're privately owned. So, you know, uh, I don't think we reach the right level of efficiency that we need fast enough. One thing is for sure is we need in the next two, three months, try to find solution that will actually get proper staffing in these independently uh, owned port in order to be able to get this, this congestion done and over because they are... The, the key factor in most of the delay, the, the vessel themselves, they, they will do the, the route in pretty much the same transit time, but they're getting struggle within port operation. Sometimes they will wait at sea three, four, five, six days before having a dock to back up. And then maybe not a truck to leave. That too. Had it, had it, yeah, add it to the list. It's, it's actually, I'm, I'm out here on the East Coast of the U.S., and that's what we've done yesterday. And today we've been visiting with some of our port partners and a few points. I mean, there's been a huge imbalance. What we saw much of L.A. Long Beach uh, through most of last year, I mean, everyone saw the the stats of 100 vessels waiting at call. Uh, the days to birth was record all-time highs. So, you know, but the East Coast actually fared fairly well through much of 2021. Now, what have that have done in 2022? And, and Christian can probably attest to this. There's grower hesitancy to ship to the U.S. ports on the West Coast. So what that's done, that's put an influx of cargo up in here to the Northeast that they didn't have the labor, the infrastructure, the truck drainage capacity, everything to do. So we've almost moved the problem a little bit or, or created another one on the East Coast. Um, I, I think what government can do and or what we can do as an industry or, or everyone to work together is finding better ways to make alternative ports of call more attractive for arrivals. Thinking of places like Savannah, Houston, that uh, aren't typically the ones seeing Miami and the others in Florida that aren't seeing as much of the commercial cargo that we tend to stuff in through LA Long Beach or Philadelphia or 
or Gloucester of trying to find ways to make a bigger balance. Now, you know, there's customs exam stations, all the other things that have to go into it. But over time, the longer term solution has got to be something that involves diversifying our heavy reliance on two or three key ports in, in the U.S. for the primary amount of our arrivals. Christian, I bring to some points around that as well. Yeah, Christian. Uh, yes, I just wanted to, to, to um, uh, complement what Stuart was saying. It's a, it's a major issue, the diversification of ports. We saw it this year in China, um, an amazing backlog of, 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 of ships waiting to enter into Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai, and, 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 and be, be trucked into mainland China. And many, many suppliers in the Southern Hemisphere are looking to diversify where they're landing, not only focusing on Hong Kong, not only focusing into Shanghai, but maybe looking up north to Dalian, and there, there are other options. And I think the, the, this situation has uh, forced many of our exporters and growers to, to, to rethink and, and, and look at these other options, for sure. So that brings us to the top of the hour. And uh, I want to take a minute, just one, to thank all of the panelists. Uh, you've, I think, brought some very interesting points to the supply chain disruption. We talked a little bit about challenges, solutions, global, domestic, and again, I want to come back to that main premise. This is an issue that we're dealing with on a global level. You know, while we need to address our challenges domestically, you know, in Canada, where we rely heavily on product from around the world, and as an export strategy, we have to ensure we can move product, you know, throughout North America and around the world. We're in this together. So, Christian, thank you for joining us and giving the uh, global perspective. Julie, the retail and your experience on uh, food security and, and other areas. Stuart on logistics. Guy as chair and your experience on the import side and, uh, and labor. I think uh, it was extremely beneficial to our uh, webinar participants. And I do want to thank all of you for uh, staying for the entire hour and uh, being part of this event. Look forward to seeing you on a future event and look forward for you to be part of some of our advocacy work that we're going to be taking part of down the road. That's going to be our uh, activities. Wally's bringing it up on our farm to plate activities, which are coming up in May. So I encourage you to visit the website and register. We will be talking about supply chains. It's going to be one of our key messages to government. So make sure you look online and register to be a part of this industry-driven advocacy event that we do in Ottawa. It'll be one of our first face-to-face -face, uh, activities. So we'll have a lot of power to drive forward our message to government and all of the elected officials around our issues. So again, thank you to everyone that have joined us today. Look forward to seeing you at future CPMA webinars and be sure to go online and listen to our podcasts that uh, can uh, be listened to at any time at your leisure. Thank you and enjoy your day. Thanks, Ron. Thanks everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.